So on our brief voyage together today, I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk about the science of early brain and child development. I want to talk about what the upshots of that are, like what do we actually see happening out there. I'd like to talk about principles of solutions and then kind of wrap the whole thing up together there. But now let's talk about the science of the, of the early brain. The American Academy of Pediatrics has been looking at this um, for the last several years in great detail. This is their agenda for children, and in the middle of it you can see and one of, one of the key strategic priorities is early brain and child development. And I'm very proud to have served on the national leadership group for this at the AAP. This is our motto, building brains, forging futures. You know, you, you need something you can put on a coffee mug or something, right? <laughs> right? But it's actually the subhead that I think is more important. It's all about nurturing relationships. And you'll hear me hit this theme of relationships and what that means over and over as I go through this. There is an urgency to this, right? We are failing too many kids as a society long before society has, and why are we, why are, we are failing them long before they fail us, right, in terms of what happens when they're adolescents and young adults and so on and so forth. The other thing is the essential role of us, and by us I mean those of us who touch the lives of children and families. There's a lot of us, and we work directly with them, and I often get asked, why is a pediatrician doing advocacy work? Like, why do I go and testify in front of the legislature and sub sub submit public comment and things like that? This isn't doctory stuff, right? You don't learn this stuff in med school traditionally. And the answer for me is very simple, because when we don't get things right, when we fail in terms of policies and programs, those problems end up in my waiting room. And then I'm banging my head against the wall, saying, I can't fix this with a prescription. I can't fix this with a simple referral. This is far too complicated. I'm trying to make sure that we fix the actual root causes of this. So why am I involved in this stuff? Because I see what happens when it doesn't go right. So in 2007, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child released a report where they tried to take all the science out there about the brain that was available and say, how can we pull this together into some big points that we can really understand and say, this is what we can use to drive good programs, good policies, and so on. And I want to walk through them because they are so important. One, child development is a foundation for community and economic development. Now, this may seem a little startling at first, right? Because I think a lot of us who work with kids and families say, we should help kids because kids are inherently a good kind of people to help, right? It's, it's this inherently a good thing. And that's a, that is true. But the thing is, they're more than that, right? They are also future potential economic units, right? This is your future citizenry. These are your future employees, your future employers, your future creators and inventors and all those sorts of things, and consumers. So if we don't think about the infrastructure of the early brain the same way we talk about other infrastructure, like highways and tunnels and bridges and airports and all that, we're leaving out a huge portion of that infrastructure. Those highways don't matter if no one's here to use them. So the economy is fundamentally about people doing things. So we need to invest in the infrastructure of the early brain the same way we sit here and talk about highways and all. I was driving down to Janesville to give a talk last night, and as you, if you've been down that stretch of highway, right? They're busy expanding and widening and there's all this stuff in the paper. Where is the controversy and the talk about our early brain infrastructure in our society? I don't see that in our public dialogue. That has to change. Number two, brains are built over time, right? So this means that you can't just put all your money into the first year of life and say, yay, we're done. We got it right in the first year. We can stop now, right? No. You need to make gains, but then you need to support those gains as you move along. So like Head Start, right? The Head Start fade out effect, all that business. Hello, you need to support those gains that were made in Head Start as you move along. You just can't say, okay, we're done. You know, those, the, the conditions and issues are still often there in the background. So you need to continue to work against those. That also means that if you don't get things right, right at the get-go, you do have some chance to fix it later on. It's harder, but you can actually fix it. We have a three-legged stool for thinking about developmental and health trajectories. We have the, the biological factors that we look at all the time in healthcare. Those are important. But then we recognize the socioeconomic environment mattered. That the zip code a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code in terms of their outcomes. Okay, this isn't some sort of inherent failing in people who are not succeeding. This is about the environment around them. But then we realized it wasn't just the broader socioeconomic environment. It's who's around them. How are they interacting with them? Who's at home? Who's in their child care center? Who's in their neighborhood? And what's the nature of those interactions? Those attachment and relationship patterns matter just as much as the other two. 
And that means that there's two things that influence the architecture of the developing brain. It's your genes and it's your experiences. And it's like a campfire. You can't have one without the other. You need to have that wood and that spark. So you need both of those kind of coming together. And if you had to pick out what is the active ingredient that makes the difference, it's what we call serve and return relationships, engagement in relationships. It's like tennis, that back and forth that happens when a child and a loving, caring, nurturing, responsive adult is interacting with them. That ultimately is the only thing that drives development. There is no app that does so. There is no TV program, no DVD, nothing that actually drives development in young children. And I challenge anyone to show evidence of anything commercially available that actually does so. There isn't any. The problem being that parents are being marketed to, being told this is good for your child's brain with absolutely no truth to that statement and they're putting their kids, I, I, I've, I'm in clinic all day today, I managed to carve out enough time to, to get over here. Just this morning I had a family, um, child who's almost three, saw him just two hours ago, and they are putting, they're showing him learning videos and all. He's profoundly speech delayed. Okay, he needs people talking to him and engaging with him, he does not need to be in front of that screen, and so on. And we had a long discussion about that and, and, and so on, and yes, he's getting birth to three and all that stuff as well, but I can see the roots of where some of this may have started. I'm going to play a video for you. Um, I worked for Edtronic when I was an undergrad as a research assistant looking at these, uh, this paradigm that he talks about, the face-to-face -face paradigm. He'll explain what it is, but you'll see what happens when this back and forth, the serve and return um, nature of interaction goes well, what happens when it doesn't necessarily go so well, but then the recovery that happens when it's something that's short-term. I'll let him explain. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh, and yeah. she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good is no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. I used to code these tapes when I was an undergrad and the hard part was not seeing interactions like that, right? This was something where the, the, the child didn't get the expected, res expected response, they got upset, but hey, mom came back within a couple of minutes and everything was fine. The hard part was when the mom would go into the still face and the baby wouldn't do anything. They just seemed unbothered by this. 
Why? Because they weren't used to getting this sort of face-to-face -face interaction, this sort of connection, all those sorts of things. And this really was something that seemed to add up. I know we're piling up in the back. If there's room off to the sides, if people want to walk through, feel free. There's a chair over there. There's one up here, I think. And then uh, there's all more, more space, so it's a little roomier. So, I, so. so um, what happens is that they, they're not used to getting this face-to-face -face interaction. So what ends up happening is that they don't feel the loss of it. Now, let me be very clear here. I don't believe for a moment that any of the parents in any of her studies, or really any parent anywhere, doesn't care about their child, doesn't want the best for them, and so on and so forth. The thing is, we think of face-to-face -face interactions as responsivity. We think of it as being natural and instinctual, right? You see a baby and you go, ah, peekaboo, right? And it's not. It's actually learned behavior. We learned it because other people did it and modeled it for us, and then we do it. And of course, when you do that, the baby's in a reasonably good mood. What do they do? They smile at you. They give you this huge smile, so you do it more and more. You're reinforced to keep doing it. If you're living in environments where you don't see these sorts of interactions happening, you don't necessarily think to do them, or you're not sure if you're doing them right. So here's something important. We have all these campaigns, right? Talk to your child, sing to your child, read to your child, right? You have billboards and ads on the bus and all that stuff. Guess what? Parents see those. They see them all the time. And they say, ah, yes, I saw that. I'm supposed to do those things. But for many of the families I work with, they come in and they won't bring this up unless you're very careful about how you ask it. Am I doing this right? I'm talking to my six-month-old. Am I doing it right? They can't talk back. Maybe I'm not the right person to talk to them because I don't understand all this child development stuff. Maybe this DVD that's made by people they claim know, that know what they're doing, maybe this is better for my child. The answer is no, it's not. Right? But there's this self-doubt, this, this perceived self-efficacy to do this job of parenting, and then thinking, well, I, I had problems in school. I'm not the best person to teach my kid. So we, we, we need to figure out how do we model this, how do we give advice, and how do we coach a parent to do this? It's not an information gap, it's a skills gap. Right? It's not just, let's put up even more billboards saying this. I don't know that more billboards is automatically what we need. It's how do we actually coach parents through this. The next point, you need simple circuits and skills in order to do more complex things. So when people say, why are we investing in children just playing? All this money for a program for them to just play. Well, as T. Barry Breslin said, play is the work of infancy. This is the child's job. So when we put kids into early childhood programs and we ask for them to get good you know, interactions and high quality interactions with people who know what they're doing, we're actually helping them build their skills. If you want to call it workforce development for the preschool set, be my guest, okay? <laughs> but this is their job. We're gonna spend some time on this next part, this idea of toxic stress, and we'll define that in a few moments. But toxic stress, it's something that happens in early childhood and it has persistent effects on the neuroendocrine system and it affects brain development in ways that affect not just learning and mental health, but also physical health. Now, you don't need to know much about how to read a head CT to see there's a big difference between these two things. So this is a CT scan of the head. It's kind of looking like a cut this way, looking up into the brain, okay? These are both three-year-old children. The one on the left is a typically developing child. And the one on the right is a child who's undergone extreme emotional neglect, okay? This is not physical neglect. They were bathed and clothed and all that stuff. This is a child, though, who was in an Eastern European orphanage in the 80s. This is when they had those large warehouse-style orphanages. There was too many kids and not enough staff. They were doing the best they could, but they didn't have time to talk and sing and play and read and all those things. It was just take care of their basic physical needs and move on to the next kid. Without knowing how to read a head CT much, that head on the right is much smaller. That brain is smaller. It looks shrunken. It doesn't look as dense with neurons. I'm giving you an extreme example because you can see that without knowing much about how to read a head CT. There's changes that happen in less extreme circumstances, and I'll show you those later. Let's talk for a moment about stress. So is there anyone here who has zero stress in their lives? No? Okay, good. Because if you raised your hand, I'd have to come over and check for a pulse. Okay? <laughs> stress is part of the human existence, right? Stress is how we respond to changes in our, in our environment. Stress is how we learn to cope and how we develop new skills and all those sorts of things. So even though we talk about stress in the sense of I'm too stressed, there's too much stress in my life, small amounts of stress are necessary. For example, right now, I can hear, once you listen to it, a little bit of sound in the background, right? Until I point it out, you've probably all learned to tune it out, 
and say, yeah, whatever, and focus on what else is going on. All of these sorts of things are things that we adapt to in our environment over time. So we need a stress response to be able to adapt, to learn, to grow, all those sorts of things. So small amounts of stress are actually a good thing. We release hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. Epinephrine is also known as adrenaline, heart beats faster and stronger, all that business. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone because it is released in stressful circumstances. Now, when that sort of thing happens, why, why does cortisol help? Cortisol, one of its many jobs is actually to reduce inflammation. How does this help? You're walking along in the woods, you trip, you, you twist your ankle. What happens? Your ankle hurts because your body doesn't want you to walk on it. It swells up. There's more blood flow and fluid to the area to help repair the damage. So you're sitting there on the ground, you're like, oh man, I'm going to have to hobble back to my car. You know, this is annoying. It's going to take forever. And then you see a bear. Okay. Your ankle doesn't matter anymore, right? Especially if it's in the bear's stomach along with the rest of you. So this is turned from an inconvenience to a life and death situation. And what happens is you send out that epinephrine, you pump out cortisol because you don't want that inflammation right now. You don't want that pain. You want to be able to run for it. Once you're safe, is your ankle really going to hurt? Sure it is. But it doesn't matter. You're alive. You're alive. You have survived. So when it's life and death, when you're in mortal danger, this stress response system works fantastic. It's terrible for long-term responses to long-term stress, and you'll see why. So there's three levels of stress response you can talk about. The small amounts of stress, positive stress, a little bit of heart rate, whatever. This is what happens every time I give a talk, okay? And that's a good thing. You don't want me falling asleep up here. You don't want me forgetting what to say, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, sound doesn't work. Slides blow up, et cetera, et cetera. It's all happened to me. I've learned to cope. So this is a good thing. Number two, tolerable stress. These are more significant stressors. They're not minor, but they're temporary. And they go away after some reasonable amount of time. And they're buffered by supportive relationships. There's a relationships piece again. Okay, Th that buffering supportive relationships keeps it tolerable. Not fantastic, but not terrible. And then you have toxic stress. Toxic stress is when the stress response systems kick in for long periods of time because those stressors stick around for a long time and there's few or no protective relationships. So in a child's life, you have situations that often are these long-term stressors. Those supportive relationships may be few and far between. This is what happens when people don't have good social capital and, and support networks and things like that. These are things like child abuse, parental substance abuse, homelessness, and so on and so forth. These sorts of things, if they happen to you as an adult, they're not great, but hopefully, if everything's gone fine until then, you still have good coping mechanisms that you've developed in those early years of life. But what happens when you're young? You don't have those coping mechanisms yet. Your brain is still sensitive and so plastic that it creates a, a cycle of things that we call toxic stress because of what it does. So what is that cycle? You get these stressors and you get this chronic fight or flight, this, this thing that was wired for bear is now going off all the time because these stressors are there, the homelessness and the abuse and all that stuff. You pump out more of these hormones. It changes the brain in ways we'll talk about in just a moment. But the upshot is you have this hyper-responsive stress response, less calm, can't cope as well, and that in turn leads to more stress, and this cycle just feeds on itself. So what happens in the brain? There's just three areas I want to look at, and this is work that's actually been done right here by, by Seth Pollock um, at UW. The amygdala is the, is the worry ward of the brain, right? This is your, your, your fear, your self-preservation, your, your act instinctually uh, to, to protect yourself. In kids who've had this early uh, adversity, we see that their amygdala are actually larger, probably because it's stimulated more in this early uh, part of life. So we can see that there's actually a difference there on MRI. Conrad and the amygdala are two areas. One is the prefrontal cortex. This is one of those checks to the amygdala. This is your planning, your executive functioning, which is like the, the air traffic control center of your brain, um, your delayed gratification, all these things that say, think through this rationally, plan, think about the long term, all that. We see these kids have less neural density often in that part of the brain, and there's less activity when you do functional MRI. And then you have the hippocampus, big role in memory and mood, and hippocampal volumes are also measurably smaller again, in these kids. So again, there are these measurable brain changes. However, I don't go loading my patients into an MRI and getting these numbers and whatever, because honestly, it's not going to change anything I do yet. Maybe someday the science will evolve that will actually help me figure out 
what I should do next, but right now all it does is simply confirm what I already know. The other thing is, no parent comes into my office and say, Doctor, I'm here because I think my child's hippocampal volumes are too small. No. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet and I doubt it will. So, what do I hear instead? I'm concerned, the school's concerned, whatever, because my child is impulsive. They can't plan ahead. They're anxious. They can't delay gratification. Their mood's all over the place. Their memory's terrible. Okay, so what does this sound a lot like? This sounds a lot like what we often term ADD, attention deficit disorder, or whatever. The thing is, though, I have patients. I have a lot of patients with diagnoses of ADHD, and some of them have classic ADHD, meaning they're trying, school's trying, parents are trying, everyone's trying, and the kids just cannot pay attention. And you know what? They do pretty well with a relatively small dose of medication. And their self-esteem comes up, and their grades come up, and everyone is happy, and they do great, and we, you know, we monitor them for you know, a few years and hopefully wean them off, and things go, things go pretty well. That is five of my patients. Not 5%, five. So what about all these other kids that I have with these diagnoses or labels of attention deficit or whatever? When I do my evaluation, I go back prenatally, and I start walking through. Tell me everything that happened. And I'm not just talking about what was their birth weight and what were their APGAR scores and were they ever hospitalized. That's important. I need to know that. But were you ever homeless? Do you have enough food to eat in the house or have you ever not had enough? Was your child ever witnessed domestic violence? And so on and so forth. And what do I hear? Yes, 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 and yes. And you start to realize by the time I'm seeing this kid at 5, 7, 8, 12, 15, whatever the age is, the pileup of stressors that has already accumulated on their physiology, on their brain and all, is really quite substantial. So what I ask myself is, is this really ADHD or is what I'm seeing the brain effects of adversity that I just talked about? And the answer is it's probably adversity. The problem is I don't have a magic pill that'll make that go away. No one does. There are evidence-based treatments, but they're hard to find. They're expensive. and it's incredibly hard for families to commit to them because it requires repeated visits for therapy and so on, and they're still working their four jobs, and they're still trying to make rent, and they're still trying to put dinner on the table. All those things matter, and matter more than some therapy that they're not really sure what it means or what's going on, right? So you might remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You gotta think about food, shelter, safety, security before you can think about love, education, all that stuff, and certainly before you think about your long-term career goals and what makes you feel happy and all that business. If you're always down here, you're never going to get to the middle part of that, that triangle. So we need to make sure that families have good supports on the bottom parts so they can actually follow through with the stuff that's sitting atop. So when kids have good experiences, we hope it leads to good brain development and that comes out in good behavior. And while I said that genes are not something that you can modify so easily, you can modify how genes are read, and that's through something called epigenetics. And I, I won't get into that because that'll take a while to talk through. But we, knew, we can see genetic evidence um, in terms of how genes are read having to do with stressors. We can even see evidence for when we don't get things right with prenatal programs. High levels of stress in a pregnant woman cause epigenetic changes in the offspring of the fetus she's carrying. Yes, the offspring of, so two generations out. We can actually show evidence of this. So what happens? We see that these things pile up and they make a big difference in terms of lifelong health. How many of you have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Okay, so a fair number of hands. And even in, when I give talks to medical audiences, there's not all that many hands that go up. This is why I call it the most important study you've probably never heard of. So what they did was they looked at a huge cohort of patients, 17,000 patients, and said, what happened to you as a child? And they asked a series of 10 questions, and I'll, I'll go through those, but it's the first time someone looked at what happened in childhood and tried to connect it to outcomes later on. Now, I wanna be very clear about something here. People often say, oh yes, 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 the ACEs study, I know all about this. That's the study of what happens when to, pe to poor people. I say, uh-uh, no, it's not. Who did they study? They studied middle class folks. They studied folks that were mostly Caucasian, college educated, in their 50s, split between men and women. So this is not a study of the impoverished, at-risk populations that we're often talking about. This is a study of the middle class, and that's one reason I think this is such a fantastically done study, because it's telling us what happens to the middle class. And you know that these things are often bigger issues 
the further down the socioeconomic ladder you go, but they also happen in higher SES groups. This is not a study of somebody else. This is a study of all of us. They looked at these different categories of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. The numbers appearing on the right is the prevalence of these things in this cohort. Just look at these numbers. These are really high. 26% said that they were physically abused during some point in their childhood. 26%. They didn't expect that, that number to be so high. Even the lowest number up there, 6%. That's 1 in 20. That's a lot of people. So these are not minor things. These are, something that, these are things that are happening over and over and over. And more importantly, this has been replicated. They've done, they've done other ACES studies. Uh, the state-specific ones is a Wisconsin-specific one. We're seeing about the same numbers. And in fact, I was speaking at a conference in California on this topic. And uh, during one of the sessions, they actually gave clickers out to the audience and went through the 10 ACES questions with them. And the nice thing about that is, is it's anonymous, right? No one has to raise their hand or anything. So they, they asked the questions these percentages were eerily similar. And this is at a conference of professionals who work in this field. Okay, so. Now the thing is, you can't, it's almost impossible to ask, so how bad was the abuse, right? You can't quantify, was it, physical abuse means I got beaten once, or it means I got beaten every day for years. And it's hard, how, how hard did they hit you? How bad was the abuse? I mean, you can't quantify that so easily, right? But what you can do is you can add up categories of these categories. So they created something called an ACE score, one point for each category listed. About a quarter had just one, but again, four or five or six of those categories, it was one in 20 for each of those. So they found the effects were unexpectedly common, but they also found that the, out, what the outcomes were cumulative. So what did they see there? Developmental delay. If you want to have a good risk of developmental delay in a child, well, give them five, six, or seven adverse childhood experiences and you will have 75 to almost 100% risk of developmental delay. And we know that developmental delay, you've got to identify it, you need to refer, therapy, all those sorts of things. You know, it takes a lot of work and effort to, to uh, help with that. It's also on the long term. This is your risk for adult heart disease. Adult heart disease. If you have seven or eight adverse childhood experiences, you have triple the odds of heart disease as an adult. This is years later. Something about adversity is baking into the biology of young children changes that are causing physical health outcomes that are quite expensive for our society and certainly not great for the individual undergoing them and so on. And there's all sorts of data that I'm not taking the time to show you right now um, in other conditions as well. But the last point that came from that was that if we create the right conditions for early brain and childhood development, it's more effective and it's less costly than trying to figure it out later on. So if you think of a child's trajectory, what's their developmental progress from like zero to five? You got the kids on the healthy trajectory, you want them to stay on that line. You got the kids we call high risk, right? This is your X 26 week preemie, right? You know they're at high developmental risk and you can label them as such and you know if you do nothing, their outcomes are not gonna be as good as they should be. And then you get the kids I worry about the most, the at risk kids. There's many more of them, they don't have nice clean labels all the time and there are a lot of them out there. And one of my colleagues says we shouldn't call them at-risk kids. We should call them children under siege because that's really what's happening. The environments around them have them under siege. They can't think about other things when they're basically focused on survival. Adversity pushes down on all these curves. So what we need are good protective interventions that help shield from that adversity. So a lot of these are things we are already doing or should be doing. Good anticipatory guidance, reading together, proper discipline, good health services, preschool, all these things will keep that curve pushed up there. For the at-risk kids, parental responsiveness training. It doesn't take a nine-week course to do this, you know, for hours on end. You can do this through short modeling and other things in, in different settings. Good language stimulation, again, from people, not products. The TV does not count. They need to hear from people who are being responsive to them, but they need to hear that language. And, of course, high-quality early childhood education. And then for the highest risk kids, all of the above, plus home visiting, specialized services, and so on. Because conceptually, Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child says there's really some promising domains that conceptually we should be thinking about. One, we need to reduce the emotional and behavioral barriers to learning. I have absolutely brilliant kids in my practice. 
amazing intellects, and they're flunking out of school. Why? There's too many layers of stuff, of behavior problems, emotional issues, etc., that have been built up from what they've been exposed to. We need to think about what we are losing as a society when this happens. I have no idea which of these kids in my practice or so many practices throughout the country might have otherwise created the next great class of antibiotics, written the next amazing symphony, figured out world peace, you know, whatever the case may be. We have no idea what we're losing. We're losing intellectual capital and we lose as a society when all we end up with is someone who ends up being dependent on what we can give them because they have too many of these issues. So we need to think about this as societal losses. The next point is something that I think you all know, but people need to be reminded of. Children live in families. You cannot transform the lives of children if you don't transform the lives of their parents. Okay, so who am I to tell a parent they should be reading to their child every night when they look at me and say, I'm not home at night because I'm working my second job because that's how we make rent. Okay, again, basic needs first. It's all I can do to get the kids to bed and, you know, get dinner made and get, get the kids to bed and all that stuff because I feel awful and I'm exhausted every night because my diabetes is out of control and I cannot afford my, my diabetes medication or my test strips or whatever the case may be, right? This is why, actually, American Academy of Pediatrics and others, we have, we've argued that we need to make sure that there's good health care, health insurance for adults. Not because we treat adults, but because they're the parents of the kids we treat, right? And this is why it matters. It does have a fallout effect on the kids. And again, health is all of our responsibility, not just those of us in health care, because health and well-being is more than simply just medical care. And the UW Population Health Institute um, says, you know, look, clinical care is only 20% of what goes into health. Health behaviors is 30%, social and economic factors is 40%, physical environment is 10 the highly expensive healthcare system I inhabit is only 20% of what goes into these things. And this is why when I do well child checks, I think of not just, you know, where's your kid sleeping and how are they eating and all that, and that, that's important, we cover that, but really my job is this, is developmental assurance. How do I help that family get that child to adulthood with not just a healthy body, but a healthy brain and a healthy mind? So, a lot of different things to think about there. A few numbers to go over bri briefly. There's 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want those connections to happen well. Because think about this concept, this idea of brain plasticity. So two major types, synaptic, cellular, don't really worry about what they mean. The key is actually here in this third line. Synaptic plasticity is lifelong. This is what we all used to learn. Cellular plasticity is already declining by age five. Yes, those kindergartners are over the hill in at least one way. So. <laughs> This is why speech delay is a lot easier to fix at age three than it is at age eight. And this is why it's a lot easier to fix at age 15 months than it is, or 18 months, as, as it, than it is at age three, and so on. Dimish, diminishing cellular plasticity limits your ability to do remediation. And there's no law or rule or whatever you can pass that changes that biological fact. This is why early intervention programs are important, and as I say to my medical students and residents, it's not early intervention if, one, you don't do it early, and two, you don't actually intervene. So, you know, this, oh, we'll see if they speak again, speak in six months. No, no, actually, this, you know, this, this, bring them back sooner. It's okay if you want to observe for a period of time, but it only, should only be a short period of time. 18 months is where we can see disparities in vocabulary appear. Okay, the Risley Heart Study um, showed us that between socioeconomic groups, we saw differences in receptive vocabulary, the ability of a child to understand words. Three different socioeconomic strata, you can see the disparity between the richest kids and the others already by 18 months, and by 24 months, you see the middle class kids splitting off from those living in poverty. We talk a lot about the achievement gap in our society. The achievement gap is not an issue of middle schools not doing their job right. It's not an issue of elementary schools not doing their job right, or even preschool. Preschool's off the right edge of this graph. If we can measure these changes here, you know darn well the brain changes started back here. We will fix the achievement gap when we seriously and substantially invest in programs that affect the first thousand days of life positively. That's, where the, that's really where the bang for the buck is. And speaking of bang for the buck, for every dollar we put into early childhood, we see four to nine dollars in returns. Who says that? Not me, I don't know anything about how to do those analyses, but <laughs> James Heckman does. He's a Nobel laureate in economics at the University of Chicago. He has made this his life's work. 
And he says the greatest bang for your buck is in programs targeted towards the earliest years. It's not zero for preschool or schooling or job training, but biggest bang for your buck. We have limited pots of money. That's where we should be going. And Frederick Douglass, long before we had MRIs and all said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. He understood this a long time ago. All right. So now that I've depressed everyone thoroughly, what can we do about it? I will give you the solution. Uh, actually, no, I won't, because it's not that simple. I'll give you principles of solutions. These are complicated problems with multiple factors. And this, this is not like polio, right, or smallpox, where we figured out how to do a vaccine, we got it out there, and we've slowly worked on eradicating these things. So what are these principles? We need solutions that do a number of things. We need to build capabilities, right? The parent who doesn't know how to do that face-to-face -face play and the responsive interaction, we can teach them that. Okay, it's not hard, and most love it. They're actually, they're thrilled about it, and they, they're glad to know, ah, I'm doing this right. We need to build capacities. Maybe the parent knows how to do these things, but they can't because they're working three jobs or whatever the case may be. So how do we lift some of these burdens from them so they can do the good job of parenting that they actually know how to do and want to be able to do? We need solutions that are based in homes and communities. Don't make them come somewhere special. It's hard to come out of your comfort zone. I was at a meeting downtown yesterday, and they're like, oh, how do we get families here and whatever? And I said, you know, some of the families that you're most concerned about don't actually come to this part of town because they don't see anyone else like them here. They feel that this is a completely different world. We need to be in their communities and where they feel comfortable, not hauling them out to somewhere else. We need to address root causes. We want to have long-term effects. We want to use a prevention mindset. We want to leverage those key first thousand days of life. We want to use evidence-guided techniques. Notice I didn't say evidence-based. There's an almost fanatical adherence to evidence-based among some folks, particularly some grant funders. And frankly, if you actually did only what's evidence-based, you would do very few things. And this also holds true for the practice of primary care pediatrics. We don't have evidence for a lot of the things we're doing. One, because it may be difficult to get that evidence for, because, you know, kids and research and all that stuff. Or two, it just hasn't been done. We should, of course, continue to seek more evidence and do more research and all those things. But I worry that we actually stifle innovation when we only insist on something that has been proven. And some of these folks keep on wanting us to prove things over and over again. I have 15 studies showing how well Reach Out and Read works in certain populations. And what do I get from a funder in state? Well, have you shown that it works in Wisconsin? What? Why? The, what, cheese-based literacy? I mean, I mean, come on, really? You know, why do we have to keep constantly reproving this stuff? Like, it, I, there's other things that I'd like to do and like to show that are more innovative, you know, and, and extensions of this stuff. But instead, we're stuck reproving the same thing over and over and over. So evidence-guided, yes. Evidence-based, wonderful, but not 100% necessary. And finally, we need things we can take to scale. Remember that 40, 45, 47% of U.S. children live below 200% of the federal poverty line. Yes, children are the single largest group in our country to live in poverty. And people don't realize that because you don't see them begging out on State Street and so on. Children are more likely to be poor than anyone else. So can we get home visiting to every one of those kids? Heck no. I love home visiting programs. I think they're fantastic. They have great outcomes, et cetera. They're really expensive, too, because they're so intensive. So we need to do those things, but we also need to do things that we can take to scale. So. As an example of one program, I'd just like to talk for a few minutes about Reach Out and Read, which is a program I've worked with a long time. So that face-to-face -face video interaction, so I was coding those videotapes in a small converted closet at Boston City Hospital, and <clears throat> down the hall was a primary care pediatric clinic, part of Boston City. And uh, I heard about this pro program where these crazy doctors were giving out books at checkups and saying to parents, read together with your child. And I said, oh my goodness, that's, that's awesome. You know, that sounds really great. And that was actually where Reach Out and Read started. Um, now it's in 6,000 clinics throughout the country, um, so it's grown a little. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, something I feel like I've kind of grown up with. And Reach Out and Read is, I won't dwell on all the details here, but we make it part of the regular checkup, the, the, re the regular well-child visit um, that, that occurs. And we integrate it in. We walk in with a book in our hand, and I forgot to pull up my books here. There we go. So we walk in with a book in hand. 
the healthcare provider, not to the front desk, not the medical assistant, whatever. We walk in with the book in our hand, we give it directly to the child. If they're 18 months or older, I give them the book upside down on purpose. Why? They can't read yet, right? These letters mean nothing to them at that age. But they say, hey, something doesn't look right about this. And I look to see, are they at least trying to start to turn it over? And they may not do it at 18 months. But you know what? It kills me when I walk in and I give a book to a four-year-old and they sit there with the book upside down, backwards, and closed for the entire visit. This happened. This was a kid who was actually a sibling of a patient. I hadn't met this family before. He was just along for the ride. We got a gently used book to give him. And I was seeing his six-month-old sibling. And I'm looking out of the corner of my eye, and he's just sitting there like this the whole time. He didn't have the intellectual curiosity to open the book. And I'm thinking, OK, this kid's going to be a setup for failure in kindergarten. And we talked about it. And at the end, and I said, to, said something gently to Mob and asked about reading and all. And her response was very interesting, right? She turned to him and said, see, even the doctor's telling you you should read. Now, here's the thing, though. She knew this was important, right? She'd seen the ad on the bus or someone. You know, somehow she knew that him looking at books was important. She didn't need to be told that. What she didn't know was, though, how do I help him, right? She was kind of doing this. Here, read, right? Just look at the book. Okay, this sort of passive idea. And I said, well, you know, you, you should actually sit with him, look at things now. You know, his attention span might be a little shorter, although at four it won't be too bad. Um, ask him to point out things, you know, and, and make it a back and forth dialogue, all those sorts of things. You know. Now, unfortunately, I lost this family to follow up. I never, never saw him again, so I don't know how things turned out. But I wouldn't have been able to observe that, he wasn't even the patient, if I hadn't had the book in hand. We give them developmentally appropriate books. So this one is a board book, great for six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, whatever. Um, Spanish language, I see a lot of Latino, Latino patients. The great thing also is that there's faces of babies, right? Babies fix on faces, we know that. And this is really affirming when you hold us out to a six month old in their parents' lap and you say, oh, look at how they're looking at this. This happened to me two hours ago, right? Look at them and the parents like, oh, wow, my little baby's looking at books. Remember that often the families I'm working with are coming from backgrounds of where they haven't had great educational attainment themselves. So for them to think, oh, my kid's smart, they're going to do that. We also look for other things. We ask, tell me, do you have a chance to share books together? Oh, really, how often? You know, in a non-judgmental way and try to encourage more of that. We try to model things like dialogic reading, you know? So, yes, and the baby touches the book. And I say, yes, that's the baby's nose, and that's their eyes, like my eyes and your eyes, OK? And naming and also I'm modeling that for the parent without saying, you know, you need to do it this way, OK? You know, no, and do all those sorts of things. This book is also a marvelous piece of engineering. It is designed for the age that needs it, right? It's a tough board book, so they can mouth it, they can throw it, whatever, and it'll stand up to that. But here's the other thing that people don't realize about board books. What happens when you push down on a page? The next one pops up. This is great when you don't have fantastic fine motor skills, right? And look at how thick these pages are. They are designed for a kid who has a palmer grasp. You cannot turn paper pages until you develop a pincer grasp. It's not about the kids tearing the pages, actually. It's about giving them something they can be successful with so they can bat at pages and all those things. I get all these opportunities. So when I walk in with a book in hand and the five-year-old jumps off the exam table, runs up to me and says, oh, if you give him a cookie, oh, I love this book, and starts flipping pages, I've learned tons. I learned about gross motor skills. They jumped off the table and ran over to me. I learned about fine motor skills. They're turning pages. I heard language. They saw the book from across the room, vision. Um, they, I know they're being read to. All these things, and that's my developmental surveillance, or much of it, and it took me about six seconds. I don't have tons of time in that room, you know? So this actually gives me a chance to kind of pick up on all those things. And it tells me that stuff <coughs> happened well when that kid's doing that. Or when the, the, the toddler takes the book, studies it, and turns around and holds it out in that read-to-me gesture to their parent. When they do that gesture, that's telling me volumes. Right? It's telling me that, hey, I know what this thing is. This is that thing that we sit down together and we enjoy looking at it together. And I know that when I turn to my parent and hold it out, there's a pretty good chance that they'll say yes and we'll do this thing. 
oh, now I've learned tons about the relationship between that child and that parent. This child knows to ask for something, that they're doing pleasurable activities together. So when all this stuff happens, as my colleague Perry Class says, that reading is a triumph of the early brain. It tells us that all this potential really came out so beautifully and so well in so many different ways. So I think about Reach Out and Read almost like the, the elephant um, uh, and the blind men, right? They're, somebody feels the leg and they feel like it's a trunk and somebody else feels the tail and they say it's like a brush and so on. Well, Reach Out and Read is kind of an example of, of that elephant because some people say, oh, you're giving away books. This is what people usually say. Oh, you're doing a book giveaway in your clinic. Isn't that nice? Well, it is very nice, but we are also trying to do an educational intervention, so I'm not banging my head against the wall when this kid is flunking out of you know, late elementary, middle school, high school. I'm trying to find a good, efficient way to do my developmental surveillance in the limited time I have. I'm trying to build the capacity of parents to do good parenting tasks by showing them how to do dialogic reading and be an effective parent doing these skills. I'm doing something that buffers toxic stress, right? Because if you sit down for five minutes at, at night and you're talking to your child in that not harried, busy, you know, slightly stressed out voice that all parents have, myself included, um, you know, hey, get this done, clean that up, put that away, brush your teeth, get to bed, right? You're talking in a different way just for a few minutes. It helps build that, solidify that relationship and, and is one of those buffers. It helps me assess the relationship between parents and children. It's a public health approach. And it's a scalable, evidence-based model. We actually do have 15 studies showing that it, it works, 16 studies showing that it works. So when it comes down to it, Reach Out and Read is not any one of these things, of course, that it's really all of these things, ultimately, uh, in how we're able to do multiple facets of things. And if you're interested in reading more about that, um, we, a colleague and I actually wrote a report called The Elephant in the Clinic. Um, and uh, it's a free download um, from that URL, or if you just type Elephant in the Clinic into Google, it pops right up. And uh, it's an it's a accessible read. It's not designed just for medical types and so on. So in Wisconsin in 2010, we had about 50 Reach Out and Read programs in the state that had popped up. There was about 30 when I moved here, and I was responsible for adding a few more. And then in December 2010, we founded Reach Out and Read Wisconsin, which is our state-level kind of nonprofit uh, that helps support Reach Out and Read and so on. And man, have we been busy. I can't even keep this map up to date. This is from January. We're already up to 180 clinics, and we have another 40 or so in the pipeline. Let me tell you that this is all organic growth, right? People are calling us. They're emailing us. They're saying, we want in on this program. This is particularly remarkable when you realize how busy primary care providers are. We are not looking for new projects or programs. We are actually hiding and cringing when, le when clinic leadership says, we have a new initiative, and we're like, oh, God, no, um, because there's so much we're being asked to do. They're calling us. There's actually one person. <laughs> I, I know her personally, but she was harassing me practically every two months because we had to put a hold. We had too many new clinics, and we didn't have enough staff. So um, she was harassing me almost every two months, saying, so when can we start? When can we start? This is resonating with healthcare providers. We don't pay the clinics. We're not adding personnel to the clinics. Whatever they're doing, this is part of their job. So it ends up being a very cheap, very efficient thing. Let me be clear. Because it's so cheap and it's so efficient, we're not going to see huge outcomes, right? I cannot prove to you that doing Reach Out and Read means they're more likely to graduate from high school. The effect size is going to get lost. But for the paltry sum that it represents and the engagement and everything else that, it comes, that comes along with it, it actually gets us pretty far. And it is a program of the Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin, which does fantastic work in um, a number of different areas. So to wrap this up, just thinking about the public health approach to building healthy brains. You've got kids that are going to fall. You need a net to catch them. This is where we haul out our big net. This is our everyone net, our prevention net. That net has big holes, okay? It's not necessarily going to catch everyone, but it's going to catch a whole bunch of kids. So we should do those things. And then for the kids who fall through that net, you bring out your second net. This is your screening, your targeted interventions. This is where your developmental screenings come in. This is where home visiting and Head Start and early intervention, all those sorts of things come in. It's a smaller net. It's also a more expensive net. You still got some holes in it, though, and then you're going to get a small number of kids, we hope, that fall through and that's your treatment net. We cannot afford that net at that size. It's not going to happen. But we can't just say that this alone is going to do it and just let everyone fall through there. All of these are necessary. None of them on their own are sufficient. Okay, You need to have the multiple steps there. 
We can think about things like the five R's of early childhood education. This comes from the AAP's School Readiness Technical Report. Kids need routines. They know what to expect of us and what is expected of them. They need reading, rhyming, which means playing, cuddling, the back and forth. It doesn't really work. They were looking for an R. Just, 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 just go with it. Rewards, and of course, relationships. We can also make a difference in policy. This joint resolution passed unanimously through the Senate and unanimously through the Assembly. And what was the resolved clause of this that thing that passed to everyone, through everyone? Resolved by the Senate, the Assembly concurring, that policy decisions enacted by the Wisconsin State Legislature will acknowledge and take into account the principles of early childhood brain development and will, whenever possible, to consider the concepts of toxic stress, early adversity, and buffering relationships, and note the role of early intervention and investment in early childhood years as important strategies to achieve a lasting foundation for a more prosperous and sustainable state through investing in human capital. I might have written two-thirds of that. Um, this, now, it's a resolution. It has no force of law. There's no funding tied to it. But you know what? We deliberately kept the name. Uh, if you read the whole thing with the whereases and all that stuff, we kept the name of specific programs out of it, including things like Reach Out and Read. I wanted this to be a gift to anyone who works with early, child, early childhood in the state. Anyone can take this and go to their elected official and say, look, we do these things. Can you help us out now with some funding? This is like chess. You've got to think a few moves ahead, not just checkers. Okay, um, so first state in the country, first state legislature in the country to have a statement like this. A few other states have copied us um, since. And you know, it's a small step, but it was an important first step, and it's what's led to the development of a children's caucus in the legislature that's only just gotten underway in the last year, um, and I've been working with them on that as well. And that's why I put the success kit up here with hashtag winning. <laughs> so I'd like to close with this quote from the Sudden Trust. While schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever-increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. And I always end uh, with this image that I took this photograph of my wife years ago, caught them in this lovely moment of being lost in a book together, her and my son. Um, it reminds me that parents are their child's first and best teachers, and we should do whatever we can to support them in that role and seeing themselves in that role, and that children are made readers in the laps of their parents, and that's really why we do what we do with Reach Out and Read and so on. My email and my public-facing social media links are here if anyone wants to follow along with things I put on Facebook and Twitter about um, child development, pediatrics, uh, policy, and so on. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that folks have. Thank you for your attention.